Can we start with some prayer? Um, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Lord, thank you that you've spoken to us by your Son. Um, your voice is powerful. You've made the universe through it. We do pray that you'll speak with your powerful voice to us now as we uh, look at this passage from Matthew. Amen. So a particular welcome to visitors. You can tell visitors because they turn up early for church, whereas everyone else turns off on time. Um, so we do hope you'll stay around for tea and coffee afterwards. What is Jesus saying? Well, we are looking today at another section of the Sermon on the Mount, so Matthew's chapter 5 to 7. This is the most famous sermon ever preached, one of the most famous speeches in history, if not the most famous. And in today's passage, um, Jesus is challenging us, asking a question, what is it that's driving you? What is it that's driving you? Um, I'd like to tell you about um, a young man who a few years ago went into a jeweler's shop and he bought uh, a beautiful necklace, a sapphire necklace for his young wife. And, and what was motivating that? He was in love with her, and he, he treasured her, and he had been saving up, and it was her birthday, and he wanted to give her a gift just to express his love. That was what was driving him. But there was another man who also bought a sapphire necklace for his wife, um, somewhere else, a slightly more expensive one, he had a bit more money to spend. Um, a couple of years later, his wife found him in bed with another woman in the house. And the question is, what was driving the extravagant purchase of that necklace? Maybe, maybe it was a pride thing. Maybe he wanted everyone to see how much he had lavished on his wife. Maybe it was an insecurity thing. Um, he wasn't sure in his relationship and, and buying more possessions would help. Maybe it was just a financial investment. Yes, it would be a gift, but it would still be his property ultimately. You see, the same action, giving a necklace can be very different if the motivation is different. What motivates us makes all the difference in the world. In today's passage, Jesus says that just the same mix of motivations can happen in our lives. And so he's asking what's driving you. If you look at the very last words of the previous chapter, chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus simply says, be perfect, because your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, a call to perfection. Jesus is calling his followers not just to have a, a set of five self-help rules to make themselves a bit better or to pull up their socks. He's not giving a set of religious ceremonies. Christianity is not about um, what we wear, where we go, what we do. Um, Jesus is calling us to be aiming for perfection. And this is going to be hard, and we know that none of us are perfect. And Jesus' followers, he knows, are not perfect but he's saying, set your eyes on perfection, aim for that, and when you fail, come back to me for grace. That's the good news, and the good news is that one day, you and I are going to stand faultless before his throne. Didn't we sing that earlier? That word faultless really struck me. Jesus is going to see us, not King Charles looking at us, but King Jesus, and we're going to be seen as faultless before him. We're not there yet. But what was the motivation for being perfect in that verse? Be perfect, therefore, because your heavenly Father is perfect. They say that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Um, I love watching the re repair shop. Did anyone watch that? The other day they had, um, uh, we were watching a Christmas episode, and the people all come in with their kids, and they're all dressed identically with their parents. It's quite funny when you see that. Uh, but it, it shows that they're flattering their parents. And, and if we want to be like God just because he's perfect, um, then that's a really pure motive. But we're human, aren't we? And the very best motives can be so mixed. Uh, someone wrote, In Jesus we glimpse just a little of a genuine beauty of perfect holiness. Uh, and then we prostitute the vision by dreaming about the way others would hold us in high regard if we were like that. The greater the demand for holiness, the greater the potential for hypocrisy. And 2,000 years ago, as Jesus stood on that mountain with crowds around him, with thousands listening to him speaking the Sermon on the Mount, um, as Jesus told them that God wanted them to aim perfection, Jesus knew the danger that you and I today would face, that we would just turn that into a mixed motivations where it's all about religious hypocrisy. Jesus says, what motivates us makes a world of difference. Uh, and he warns us of the three biggest, biggest dangers in this area, Okay. 
there's the most common wrong motives for trying to live for Jesus might be a desire to impress others, a desire for material possessions, or just being driven by faithless worry and anxiety. We're only going to look at the first two of those today because it would be too long. So it's increasingly out of order, this dip into the Sermon on the Mount. But you should be thankful we're not. Martin Lloyd-Jones took a year to go through the first chapter of Matthew. So we'll get there eventually in order. Um, so let's look at the first wrong motive that we might have. And Jesus warns us about it. It's this desire to impress others. Um, you'll see that uh, right back there in chapter 6, verse 1. And it comes up several times. So let's say that you've got a committed Christian friend who you really respect, and they're at that monthly prayer meeting every Wednesday evening. They're also there at the Saturday morning prayer breakfast, and they're, they're turning down other things to be there. And they're praying at home in their quiet times. You can tell that because on the fridge, there's a set of prayer letters up for all the missionaries they're praying for. And when the WhatsApp message goes around that someone in the church needs help, they're the first people to respond. Uh, and you admire them greatly. But it turns out there are two things you don't know about that person. Firstly, what they've done makes no difference in God's sight at all. And secondly, your friend doesn't actually care about that because it was all done for your benefit. Um, Actually, they got what they want, which was your respect and admiration. Now, surely we wouldn't slip into anything so crass here, would we? Well, there's a theme running through the whole of this chapter 6, Uh, And the headline's there in verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. These are Jesus' words to Jesus' followers like you and me. And you see, Jesus says this is a real danger for us. And I know when I look carefully at my own heart, I I see that danger there. I see the mix of motives in my heart. Um, You know, particularly this morning as I stand up and preach, isn't that a a respected thing to do? What's driving me? Might there just be a desire to impress, um, to look forward to the nice comments I'll get afterwards over coffee? Um, What about us? There's a key word here, which is righteousness, which means being right with God. Throughout this sermon, Jesus calls us to follow him, and he, he does indeed want our lives to be right. He does want us to aim for perfection. So before we look at what Jesus is saying, let's just think about what he's not saying. He's not saying that he doesn't want us to live a righteous life in public. That wouldn't make any sense. In particular, in the previous chapter, Jesus talked about being persecuted because of righteousness. If we we want to live Jesus' radically different way of living in this world, then we are going to be different from the culture around us. And we can't hide that. um, If we want wholehearted... um, pursuit of reconciliation, if we want to avoid sexual sin, if we want to stay married, if we want to speak plainly, if we want to turn the other cheek, uh, if we want to give to those who ask, then we can't keep that hidden. And, and Jesus does want us to do these things. He wants us to be salt and light. We were thinking about that previously. So why is Jesus warning here against that question of what motivates us? If you want to live a righteous life, why is that? And for many people, it's simply to be noticed by others. If you look at the history of the church, we've got this wrong so many times for so many centuries. And I don't know if you've heard people say something like, I love Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, but I don't want anything to do with church because it's full of hypocrites. Have you ever heard that? Or something like that? We hear it all the time, don't we? People are right. Church is full of hypocrites. Jesus says it will be. But what Jesus says gets under our skin, doesn't it? Because... How much of what we do in our lives is actually affected by what other people think of us? For some people, it matters more than others. Some, I, I love it when I meet someone who really doesn't care what other people think, and it's just really refreshing. They dress differently, they say things which are a bit radical, and I think, I want to be like them. But for me, I, I'm a people pleaser. I don't, hands up if you're a bit of a people pleaser. Some people more than others. Yeah, it, it, it's dreadful, isn't it? In a social situation, I just want people to like me, to, to respect me, to admire me. But caring what others think about us can become a little hidden idol in our lives. Um, It's a quote from John Calvin, um, who's a great reformer. And he says, if honour is rated the highest good, then our ambition will take complete charge of the man. If money, then greed takes over. 
if pleasure, then men will certainly degenerate into mere self-indulgence. Um, so I wonder what you rate as the highest good. Uh, I guess if we worked in the city of London, many would rate money very highly. Personally, I work in an academic institution where respect and honour are rated very highly. So much of what goes on is driven by that desire to earn respect. Um, but many of us are people pleasers, and that's what Jesus is picking up on here. And that carries over into our Christian lives. So Jesus picks up three areas in our Christian lives where we might be people pleasers. Uh, and you can see that in terms of financial giving in verse 2, in prayer in verse 5, and fasting in verse 16, which we didn't read. So let's spot the pattern in each. Um, these people show their good side to everybody. People are hypocrites. There was nothing wrong with what people are doing with prayer and fasting and giving, but in verse 2, the giving is being done prominently to gain maximum exposure. It's announced with trumpets. Now, this is ridiculous, isn't it? But imagine the, the trumpets being blown at the temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the heart of a Jewish nation where people would live. Maybe someone who made a particularly fantastic donation, you know, 200,000 gold pieces, and the trumpets are blown to announce that exciting good news, to encourage others to do the same. Or maybe there was a particular financial need and the trumpets were blown and it would be an opportunity just to be the first to shut up your shop and rush up to the temple and, and give because people would see you doing that. So, there's nothing wrong with giving, but it, if, um, if it's being driven by a motivation to impress other people, then the reward, what reward do these people get? I tell you the truth in verse 2. They have received their reward in full. Um, that was the admiration of people around them. But he says there is a different sort of person. There's a person in verse 1 who knows God personally as their father in heaven. God is not a distant judge. He is our father who loves us. And these people are motivated by giving in secret to please God. Um, you might ask, well, what does Jesus mean by that reward? What, what, what is a reward in heaven? Um, I don't think he's talking about earning merit with God and, and getting a better place in heaven um, or, or getting brownie points or anything like that. I, I think what they're, they're, trying to, they're, they're not trying to use God to get something that they really want. The, the giving itself is a reward. You know, if you get pleasure out of giving to someone, that, that is great reward. If we're giving to God's children or in God's name, that is sufficient reward in itself. Uh, so but what we give will be a blessing to others. But when we fast and we're devoted to seeking God in a particular way, then he'll bless us with a particularly close walk with him. If we pray and we hear an answer to prayer and we see God answer prayer, I mean, isn't that just the most exciting thing? Have you ever been excited by seeing a specific answer to a specific prayer? It just makes you want to sing and praise the Lord. That is reward in itself. So if all this is true, I wonder what the application is in this passage for us today. Well, I think Jesus is saying, live like this. It's wonderfully freeing to know God as our Father, that we don't have to impress him, and we simply live just to please him. And we can be free from the yoke of trying to impress other people, of trying to earn their respect. So, practically speaking, in giving, Jesus' assumption is that we are giving, and he says not if you give, but when you give. It's verse 2. So there are some right ways to give. You'll have noticed, if you're a visitor here, that it WCC, we don't hand around a collection plate or a bag. And there's several reasons for that. One of them is it's a real opportunity to be giving to impress others. Though I remember my mum at a Catholic church once seeing somebody take some change out of the collection as well. They put in a £20 note and they took out £10 and it was all a bit shocking. So um, it's also, it puts pressure on visitors. They think all we want is for your money. You know, if you're not a believer or you're not a member of this congregation, we do not want your money. We want you to discover Jesus, okay? Um, but it does mean we still give. Um, you can find out more about that online on the website. I'll tell you also how not to do it. My dad went to a church in Florida. It was a big evangelical church with a couple of thousand people, I think. And they said, right at the start of service, hands up if you're a new hair around here. So dad's just in his suit because he's English, um, put up his hand. And they sent around a pat chap with a flag and they said, follow this man. And they got all the 20 or so new visitors to the church out into a separate room. They missed the service. They just had to sit down and talk about how to give to the church. Dad was appalled, <laughs> never went back there. So we're not into that. But if you want to give to God's people, want to give to his work, um, we can be giving potentially as a church to support these, um, these needs overseas. Then find us on the website or talk to Wendy or Priscilla about it. 
Um, secondly, the biblical model is of planned giving. So it's regularly and in proportion to what we have. It can be tax efficient. In Australia, you couldn't do this. But in England, if you give to the church and you've got a gift aid form, then all the income tax you paid gets given back to the church. And it adds up to something like 30% more, which is brilliant. So we can be organized. But we shouldn't also brood on our giving. Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. There's that time in April or May when you fill in your tax return and you think, here's all the money I've given to the church. And you can feel quite smug about it. Jesus doesn't want us to be feeling like that. He wants us to just say, I don't even want my left hand to know what the right hand is doing. I'm giving to please God and that's it. Is it wrong to talk about giving to our children? Well, absolutely not. If people don't talk to us about giving, then our kids are never going to learn. It's great if they've got a money box when they get their pocket money, but they can choose to give into that. And our, our kids love it when... Christmas time, we open, see how much money is in the money box that is for giving, and they can choose what to give to. My grandfather wasn't a Christian, but um, he stayed with family in America once, and the, um, the father's son had just got his first job, and he heard his father explain to his son, son, you're going to get your first paycheck. 10% of that is for the Lord straight away. Uh, and it really impressed my grandfather that uh, this family were going to be generous. So that's giving. What about prayer? Well, we won't be worrying about where we pray, um, how we do it, and who sees us. We'll just get on with it, seeking to talk with our Heavenly Father, because that's what children do. My eldest is off at university, and we love it that he phones home and WhatsApps us, not to impress his friends with what a good, diligent son he is, not because he needs his next paycheck, um, just because he likes to talk to us, (laughs) mostly about rowing. Um, (laughs) But I'd encourage us here to delight in this privilege of prayer. Um, As Al spoke to us last week from the Lord's Prayer, at the heart of this passage, we jump around it today, Um, at the heart of it is a relationship with our Father. Uh, At WCC now, one of our three priorities is about prayer, uh, and that's going to be corporately as well. If we don't pray together, then how will we learn how to pray from each other. Um, Praying together is is a great opportunity to encourage one another, but also there'll be prayer behind closed doors where no one else can see. Jesus says, if you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there'll be a mixture of praying together as a group and praying privately in our room. Just to say again, corporate prayer, praying together as a group is very biblical. The Lord's Prayer, it's really struck me. Every line is our, our Father in heaven. This is written for the church prayer meeting, isn't it? We could almost just have prayed it now in our time together. Um, uh, Your kingdom come. It's not um, my daily bread, it's our daily bread. It's not my debts, but forgive our debts. It's not deliver me, but deliver us from temptation. So I think there's a challenge in the Lord's Prayer to corporate prayer. Uh, And it's my my hope and prayer that the monthly prayer meeting is going to grow in in excitement and uh, in numbers there. Also on on Sunday mornings, we'd love to have a stronger focus on prayer. We had a particular time today and at least once a month we'd like to be carving out a bit more time to pray like that. Uh, And people could be meeting up in twos and threes. That's a bit more hidden and secret. Jesus honours that. It's great when you prayed about something specific with somebody else in prayer and the two of you can say, I remember you prayed that. God answered it. Wasn't that great? And likewise with fasting, Jesus doesn't say if you fast, but when you fast. And going without food for a meal or two is a great discipline to help us to focus our prayer, to to say to God, this issue is more important than even my food and drink. Um, If you'd like some guidance on that, we might not talk with someone like Al, who's been doing fasting for for a while. Uh, People at WCC are fasting but you probably don't know about it because they don't turn up at the prayer meeting and go, oh, I've not eaten anything all day and I'm looking somber and hungry. And lastly, on Jesus' point about not practicing our righteousness in front of others to be seen them. Um, I've been challenged about this. At WCC, we have a lot to be proud of. In this community, we've done great stuff down the years. There's the St. George's Day events, the, the Holiday Club, um, uh, and the craft evenings. But there's a danger that we just think, aren't we impressive? Or or we might be tempted to put on stuff to impress others. I don't think Jesus wants to see that motivation going on. Good. More briefly, the second of those two dangers is of materialism, and I will be more brief. Um, Verses 19 to 24, Jesus warns us against hoarding material possessions, or they will own you. 
Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Our society is driven by materialism, isn't it? The the drive to acquire more things, more money, a bigger home, a smarter car, a newer bathroom, a more powerful phone, nicer clothes, or perhaps a second home. My wife used to work at a practice somewhere outside Wheatley where the partners were particularly driven by money, and one of them had this extra big home down in the door door, and then they had to work extra hours to pay the mortgages so they could have a nice relaxing place. And their life just got more hectic and chaotic, and this drive for materialism was just, it was utterly pointless. Our possessions can own us, but they're, they're ultimately ephemeral. They're wasting away. They're destined for destruction. We go to the, the wardrobe and we find our hand-knitted cashmere jumper has been eaten by moths. I had a silver paper knife I was given as a child and I was too young to get letters. So I put it in a safe place in my loft and 10 years later I went up to get it and it was treasured and I opened it and it was rusted. And now I've got the internet, I don't need it anyway. But moth and rust destroy. Um, And then there's my first car. It it was a third-hand black Fiat Uno, and I I looked after it. And and it got a bit rusty um, when I was a student. So um, the the, the door sill, I sanded off, um, electric drill, take away the the rust, the loose stuff, then use hammerite to harden it, then layer of primer, then uh, an aluminium grill, and then you build it up with coarse fiberglass and smooth fiberglass, you sand it down, then you primer again, two layers of black paint, and then you get touched in so that the colours, you polish it. It looked beautiful in January. February, it catastrophically failed its MOT and I had to pay for it to be scrapped. I've never loved a car again. What is the point? We can't take this with us. Um, Verse 19, rust may may actually mean vermin eating away at harvest. In our house in Marston, when Samuel was little, we had rats in our house eating away at the apples. I, I, I love mice now because they're so much smaller. If you've got mice, you haven't got rats. When the mice disappear, you get worried. <laughs> Maybe it's the second-hand metro. For me, I've had um, <laughs> three bikes nicked to date. It was also my granny's... The next car after the Fiat was this metro, but they were built at Cowley Car Plant, so everyone in Oxford knew how to hotwire them in seconds. So then it was driven by a joyrider on a Saturday night and dumped in... Um, Oxford Sports Ground, and just annoy me. Having destroyed the suspension, they ripped out the distributor cap, so I had to pay for it to be towed away. <laughs> Thieves break in and steal. Moth and rust destroy. Um, and the same is true of our wealth in bank accounts, isn't it? Ices can depreciate. Mortgage rates can go up. Pay in real terms can fall. Or we can lose our jobs. So we need to be very careful where we're storing up. Can I give you a little story? from? I do like The Week magazine. If you've, do you get The Week? Have you read about the man who accidentally threw away his hard drive? Okay. This was one of the first five people in the world to get into Bitcoin. He's called James Howell from Wales. Um, I, uh, you can read the full article, but um, a few years earlier, I had spilt some lemonade on the computer. So he, in 2013, he read about someone in Aussie who'd sold some Bitcoins and bought a penthouse. So he, he went back to his hard drive. A few years later, earlier, I'd spilt some lemonade on the computer I'd used to mine my Bitcoin and I carefully removed the drive and saved it, and my Bitcoin wallet had been on that. But three months before discovering how valuable the cryptocurrency had become, Howells had tidied up his study, throwing away old cables, keyboards, bits of PCs, and an old hard drive that had such a small memory it wasn't worth keeping. I'd asked my partner to take away the rubbish bag to the docks, way landfill site in Newport, where there are general waste containers like big skips. But she told me to take it myself, which was fair enough, he says. I was going to take it the next morning, and that night I made a mental note to check it was the right drive I was throwing away. There had been two in my desk, and one contained the Bitcoin wallet, but when I got up, she had already taken the bag while dropping the children at school. It's somewhere in a 200 by 250 metre square heap of rubbish, and it's worth 100 million pounds. Wealth is so uncertain, and even if he ever gets it back, he won't be able to take it with him when he goes. The spiritual reality that Jesus is teaching us is this. You can be the richest person in the world, but in reality have nothing. For James Howells, it was literally true, but for us, it's possible to have everything we could materially want, but to be spiritually destitute. You know, in the Bible, there are 500 verses, roughly, talking about faith, and about 500 on prayer. On money, there's about 2,350 verses. It's clearly something that God thinks is an issue for us, a real danger. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he's against wealth. God is a generous giver, and he wants us to receive good gifts with thanksgiving. It says that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
Everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Later on, 1 Timothy 6 says, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So if God has blessed you materially, give thanks, delight in it, enjoy it. And Jesus isn't against saving. Proverbs 6 talks about admiring the ant who works hard and saves the way. We should provide for our families and our needs. But what Jesus is against here is hoarding up wealth, heaping up more than we need, turning material things on earth into our ultimate treasure. Jesus is very clear in verse 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The heart and the Jewish thoughts more than just the seat of our emotions. It's our desires, our ambitions, our thoughts. And what Jesus is saying is that what you and I treasure in life will define us. It will define our ambitions and our goals. If your treasure is stored up on earth, maybe at the bottom of a rubbish dump, then that's going to be your focus. Maybe it's a focus on a good income or a pay rise at work or a promotion or a nice car. Those things aren't necessarily wrong, but if that's the defining motive in our life, then Jesus says we're going to be ruined. So what should we invest in? Jesus says store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Uh, And that means we'll use our God-given possessions for God's glory. We will do good, we'll be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. I find this very challenging. Um, Let's ask ourselves how we how well we're doing in this area. It might be something we talk about over coffee in in just a few minutes, and we've got some coffee questions coming up at the end to help us talk about what do you find the greatest temptation to try to impress others, and what treasures on earth is it that tempts you most to take your eyes off Jesus? I mean, how willing are we to give to gospel work or, or, or about the way we spend our money? Do we ever pause to ask if we need that extra item? Naomi's been particularly good at helping me get rid of things. Don't throw in any hard drives, please. <laughs> checking. But uh, I find it quite hard to take stuff to the recycling centre or to, or to Oxfam. But do we actually need more stuff? Two of the happiest phases in our lives were the first few weeks in Australia where we moved there. We had what we'd carried with us. And before our shipping turned up. We didn't even have internet to begin with. We just had each other and we chatted to each other as a family. When we came back to England, I'd spent about £3,000 storing junk in a uh, a skip. And it was was treasured possessions. No, it wasn't a skip. It was a container which I left in Southampton. I got back and said I can come down to pick it up. They said we moved it to Birmingham. like, what? It was tables and chairs, antiques, lovely things. But when we opened up that container, it was like looking in a skip. I thought, Why have I saved all this clobber? It did not make our lives happier to get back 12 chairs and tables and things, which we now don't have room in our house, so we need a bigger house. Talking about houses. The other thing in the week, I've given up reading the news stories because they're just depressing. I've heard it all on BBC One already, but the first thing I turn to now is the the week's houses. I mean, this is great. Splendid Georgian and Queen Anne properties. I mean, this Cranfield house, built in 1709, designed by Pesner, it prays for its um, 1.87 acres of mature gardens, main suite, five further bedrooms, family breakfast rooms, coach house, double garage. I love these pages, but is looking at them and feasting my eyes on them making me more content in life? I, I, I'm not sure it is. I think we're going to have to stop getting this magazine too. <laughs> if you look at the, uh, the adverts, you know it's aimed at different people anyway. I should wrap up. Jesus comes back to this tension, this choice between two treasures, the way... Two ways to see. I, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can only have one master. This was written before the days of job shares and flexible working. I've done working for two masters, but if they both want 100% of your time, you, you, you cannot do it. It's not just you should not, you cannot. Jesus is really clear and practical. You cannot serve money and serve him. It's simply impossible. So to finish, I'd like to encourage us how good this teaching is today. It's really good news. God knows our hearts. He made our hearts. He knows what's good for them. And he delights to give us what's best for us and to withhold things that won't be good for us. That's why I don't have Cranfield House. Um, If we learn to live life a little more simply, to have a little less busy life, and I'm speaking to myself here, I know, a life less cluttered with stuff and less dominated by possessions, if we can learn to be content with what he's given us, and learn to be generous in giving, and I need to work on that.
then we will find it releases us to um, enjoy the escape from that treadmill of life. And if as Christians we live like this, it's really countercultural, it's really going to provoke questions. It's a very powerful witness. Uh, because people around us will see that we know who's boss. We've got a very different master to serve. And it is the most satisfying and most joyful way to live. Um, let's ask for God's help in these areas. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Lord Jesus, we can't serve other people trying to impress them. And we are sorry for the many times our motives are mixed and we do that. And Lord, we're sorry that our eyes rove on houses and cars and bank balances. Please help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and to sit light to these things, to give thanks for good blessings, but not to live for them. And we do pray that this would raise questions in the lives of people around us. Amen.